Welcome to Lesson 13b, Laminar Flat Plate Boundary Layer. In this lesson, we'll show the step-by-step -step boundary layer procedure for solving boundary layer problems. I'll illustrate this procedure by working through a simple problem, the Laminar Flat Plate Boundary Layer, and I'll do an example. First, here's a summary of the boundary layer equations. We restrict ourselves to steady, 2D, and incompressible flow, and our boundary layer equations reduce to these, continuity, X momentum and Y momentum. Here's the step by step boundary layer procedure. First, we calculate capital U of X, the irrotational outer flow. To do this, we use either the Euler equation or the Laplace equation for irrotational flow. We can also use superposition to generate more complex flows, as we've discussed in previous lessons. Step two is to assume a thin boundary layer. We don't really do anything mathematical in this step, we just assume that this boundary layer is so thin that it does not affect the irritational outer flow that we calculated in step one. Step three is to solve the boundary layer equations. We plug our capital U of X into this equation and solve these two equations simultaneously. Once we've solved the boundary layer equations, step four is to calculate quantities of interest, such as boundary layer thickness, the skin friction drag on a body, etc. Finally, step five is to verify that the boundary layer is thin. In other words, delta over L is very small. In a typical problem, L is associated with the body dimension, and delta is the boundary layer thickness. The smaller this ratio is, the more valid our boundary layer analysis. As with most concepts, it's best to illustrate this procedure by working through an example problem. I'll do the laminar flat plate boundary layer, which is really the simplest boundary layer problem you can imagine. We have a uniform free stream parallel to an infinitesimally thin flat plate. We define x from the front of the plate, and I'll go through these steps in detail. Step one is to calculate the outer flow. In this case, u of x is just a constant, since it's a uniform stream. That's why this is the simplest boundary layer problem. Step two is to assume a thin boundary layer. The key here is that it's so thin that it does not affect the outer flow. I redrew that here. From the outer potential flow point of view, there is no boundary layer. Step three is to solve the boundary layer equations. Continuity is the same as we had above. And in this problem, since u is a constant, the pressure term, or the u du dx term, goes to zero. I list the four boundary conditions here. These two are the no-slip condition at the wall. This is the condition at the outer edge of the boundary layer. You may be wondering why we say y going to infinity. Looking at the whole problem from a distance, the boundary layer is infinitesimally thin. But when we're solving the boundary layer equations, we're looking in detail and zoomed in on the boundary layer and y actually goes to infinity. Realistically, once we get a little bit above delta, u does not change anymore, theoretically all the way to infinity. Finally, at the leading edge, the flow does not yet realize that this wall is there. So u is capital U for all y at x equals zero. This set of equations and boundary conditions looks simple enough but you actually cannot find an analytical solution. It was first solved by Blasius back in 1908. He didn't have a computer, but he did it numerically by hand. I won't go into the details of the solution. It involves assigning a similarity variable, eta, which I show here, and solving for a non-dimensionalized form of the x component of velocity, f prime equal u over capital U. I teach a detailed solution of this in my graduate fluids class. Here we'll just accept the solution the key is that one single similarity velocity profile holds for any x location along the flat plate. In other words, the velocity profile shape is similar or the same at any location. It's merely stretched vertically as the boundary layer grows. I illustrate this in the next figure. The key here is that there is no length scale in the problem. The plate goes to infinity. So if you're looking at this from some far distance, like a giant would see, and now we zoom into the front part with a magnifying glass, we have an ant's view of this flow. But since there's no length scale in the problem, these two flows look identical. That's what we mean by the similarity analysis. We solve for this function f prime or u over u numerically as a function of eta, and I plot that here. The nice thing about a similarity solution is that this one plot is valid for any x location. This is the famous Blasius boundary layer profile for a laminar flat plate boundary layer. I also plot some experimental data, and you can see that the Blasius profile is a big success. It matches almost exactly with experiment. Step four 
is to calculate quantities of interest. First, I'll calculate delta, the 99% boundary layer thickness. Delta is the y location, where u over capital U equals 0 0.99. From our plot, we see that this occurs at eta near 5, where this distance is eta at delta. Thus, it turns out after a little bit of math that delta over x is 4.91 over the square root of rex, where rex is rho ux over mu, or ux over nu. Next, we'll calculate tau w, the shear stress at the wall. The shear stress on the fluid is tau w to the left. The shear stress on the plate is to the right. Because of friction, the flow is trying to drag the plate to the right. From the flow's point of view, the plate is slowing the flow down, which is why we have a boundary layer in the first place. We calculate tau w by taking the slope, since tau w is defined as mu del u del y at the wall, or at y equals zero. Again, we have to do a little bit of math where we get the slope in our non-dimensional variables and then go back to dimensional variables. And in typical fluid mechanics fashion, we generate a non-dimensional quantity for tau w. Cf, comma, x is defined as tau w over 1 half rho u squared. And for this flow, it turns out to be 0 0.664 divided by the square root of r e sub x. Cf, x is called the local skin friction coefficient. Cfx changes with x, as you can see in this equation. We'll also calculate the total skin friction on the plate up to location x. The plate itself is infinite, so the total skin friction would be infinite. But we're interested in skin friction at some location. Here's the plate and our boundary layer. Because Rex is in the denominator here, the skin friction decreases as we go downstream. In other words, tau w goes down as x goes up. We calculate the total friction force due to drag along the plate, or skin friction drag, by integrating along the plate. In other words, integrating tau w from this equation. So I write Fd friction equal b, which is the width into the page, times the integral from 0 to x of tau w, which is a function of x, dx. And then we plug in this equation. Tau w is this quantity times 1 half rho u squared. So we have this integral. We rearrange this as 1 half rho u squared a times 1 over x integral 0 to x of 0 0.664 over the square root of rex dx, where a is b times x, which is the surface area of the plate. And we're talking here about one side of the plate. We recognize this as cfx, or local skin friction coefficient. And we'll call this grouping of terms cf of x without the comma x, which is the average skin friction coefficient over the whole plate from 0 to x. When you do this integral, we end up with cf is 1.33 over the square root of rex. And our equation for fd friction is then this quantity times cf, where fd friction is 1 half rho u squared a times cf of x, which is the skin friction drag on one side of the plate from 0 to x, where a is called the planform area, which is the area looking from above, which is here b times x. We can write it this way, cf of x is fd friction over 1 half rho u squared a, which as I said is called the skin friction coefficient due to friction drag along the wall. Recall the drag coefficient from a previous lesson, which was fd over 1 half rho u squared a. So for a flat plate aligned with the flow, drag coefficient is the same as cf of x, provided that we use the correct a. As a side note here, for the general case of flow over some body, the total drag force is made up of two parts, friction drag due to shear stress along the walls, and pressure drag where the pressure in the aft region of the body is typically lower than the pressure in the front region. For our flat plate boundary layer, we have FD friction, but there's no pressure drag. By the way, this is typically called skin friction drag. The other difference is that A is typically the projected frontal area when you're talking about flow over bodies like this. In our case, our flat plate has no thickness at all, so the frontal area is zero. That's why A is the planform area here. As long as we know which A we're using, this drag coefficient is valid. And as I said, in our case of the flat plate, the drag coefficient is the same as the skin friction coefficient, CF. I'll mention finally that for a plate exposed to flow on both sides, top and bottom, we multiply by two. Finally, step five is to verify that the boundary layer is thin. We had this expression for delta over x, 
And if we're doing a practical problem where the plate is not infinite but is of length L, then we let x equal L at the end of the plate. And we'll define delta at the end of the plate at x equal L. So delta over L is 4.91 over the square root of REL, where we define REL the same way we defined REx, but set x equal to capital L. Is this small? In other words, is delta over L very small compared to 1? Well, it will depend on Reynolds number. Remember that boundary layers work best for big Reynolds numbers. If REL is 10,000, delta over L becomes 0.0491, or approximately 5%. That's not real small. But it's small enough that these boundary layer calculations are reasonable. If REL is 10 times bigger, delta over L is 0.015, or about 1.5%. So the boundary layer approximation is, again, better as Reynolds number gets bigger. As a quick preview of coming attractions, REL can't get too big, or the flow will start transitioning to turbulence. And then this laminar flow solution is no longer valid. This typically occurs above this Reynolds number. So the calculations are good for this Reynolds number. Now I'll do a quick example problem. Craig puts a standard 4 by 8 foot sheet of plywood on his roof rack. I convert it to metric. He drives at this speed, and I give the air density and kinematic viscosity. We want to estimate the boundary layer thickness at the end of the plate and the drag force on the plate. We'll assume a laminar boundary layer, but we need to verify this. We calculate the Reynolds number at the end of the plate, u times l over nu, which gives 2.5168 times 10 to the sixth. This Reynolds number is too large for laminar flow. This will be a turbulent boundary layer. Let's calculate here anyway for laminar flow. In a later lesson, I'll return to this same problem and solve it for the turbulent case to compare. First delta, from our equation we solve for delta, we get 7.55 millimeters. Fd, which is Fd friction, is given by our equation above, where in this case, the plate is exposed to the flow on both sides, and A is L times W, where W is the width into the page, and L is the length in the flow direction, and this is our capital U. We know that CF is 1.33 over the square root of REL. Putting all this together, this is our answer in variable form. Now we plug in the numbers. Rho, U squared, and our term with Reynolds number, L, W, and a unity conversion factor, and I get FD to three significant digits. This is a pretty small drag, since Newton is actually a very small unit of force. In fact, it's probably negligible compared to the total car drag. In real life, the plywood sheet won't be exactly aligned with the flow. In fact, it'll probably sag. The flow may separate, either on the top or bottom or both. I've already pointed out that this Reynolds number is too large for laminar flow. The flow will be turbulent. Plywood's not perfectly smooth, and it's not infinitesimally thin either. All of these issues will make FD, the drag force, increase compared to this small number that we calculated up here. Finally, step five is to verify that the boundary layer is thin. For this problem, I get delta over L is 0.003 something, or about 0.3%. So that certainly is thin. But again, this assumes laminar flow turbulent boundary layer will be thicker, as we'll find out in a later lesson. I'll make one final comment. Flat plate boundary layer calculations like we did here are often used as a quick estimate, kind of a back of the envelope estimate, even for other geometries. For example, if we have flow over some kind of a wing, and we want to estimate the skin friction drag, we can use the flat plate boundary layer results as a quick estimate, using arc length as L. It won't be exactly correct, but it'll be in the right ballpark. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.